Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Joseph. I'll be your MC this morning. Uh, how, how are you enjoying DEF CON so far? I guess I guess this is the this is the group of people that didn't party or did party hard and just didn't go to sleep and just continued uh, with the drill. So um, I appreciate you for being here in the morning. I know it's tough, uh, <laughs> um, but um, without further ado, because we are getting to our time. Uh, we are going to start with some heavy topics uh, right in the morning. Uh, Matt Dybel, the research and product lead at Otis, is going to present his talk about uh, an overview of automated market making mechanisms. So please put your hands together for Matt. All right. Hey, everyone. Um, so. Odos is a uh, DEX aggregator. Um, and so while building it, I have had the unique opportunity to really um, do a deep dive into the different automated market maker mechanisms that control billions in DeFi TVL every day. So the aim of this talk is going to be to um, try to cover as many of these as possible, uh, primarily the ones that currently control uh, a large amount of TVL. So it's not going to be completely exhaustive, but hopefully it's uh, close, as close as possible in 25 minutes. Um, and then we're going to tie that back into DEX aggregation, why it's needed, and what it's for. So to start off, I want to briefly cover um, some of the basic principles that uh, we can think about while we're going over these many different mechanisms. So. First, I think it's useful to clearly define what we're actually trying to do um, with these market-making mechanisms. So we can start off by clearly defining what a market maker is. So a market maker has a portfolio of assets, and they're trying to earn yield on that portfolio. Um, and they do that by allowing people to trade through it. And so essentially what happens is uh, they offer to sell an asset at a slightly higher value than they will buy it back, and that creates this spread um, that serves as revenue that they earn on um, the volume that goes through their platform. Now, the catch is that this revenue is not risk-free, right? Uh, people are, when trading is happening, we're actually changing the composition of the portfolio, um, and this also leads to a change in value in the portfolio. And so what can happen is if the change in value in the portfolio as a result of the trading uh, outweighs the revenue, then you're now losing money and you're not actually earning any yield. And so uh, we really need to do a good job designing the, uh, the strategy and how we're actually pricing and allowing people to trade. So with that objective in mind, we can now think about what tools we can use to actually um, decide on the pricing, right? So there's many different types and strategies, of course, but we can sort of simplify it down to two basic paradigms. So the first of which is uh, price discovery. So this is essentially reacting to um, what's happening in the market. So if we think of a simple example, if at the current price, lots of people are buying, that means the price is probably a bit too low and you should raise it up. And so by reacting to how people are interacting with the prices you set, you can sort of follow around the market price and discover what the market thinks the price is, um, which is a very powerful mechanism. But of course, if you're following around what the actual market price is, um, you're not actually really uh, providing the best price at any given time because you're always trailing behind. And so ideally what we'd like to do is just be providing the price that people actually want to buy and sell at, right? We want the real market price. And so we can try to approximate that by leveraging price oracles. 
So trying to leverage some external knowledge um, to decide on the price without actually having to discover it ourselves. And so this can be extremely powerful because you can really then concentrate your liquidity and uh, general pricing strategy around what people actually value an asset at. But it can also be very detrimental because if, you're setting, if your price oracle is wrong, well, then you have the same problem with price discovery except quite a bit worse, potentially, right? So real quick to give some concrete examples, uh, one thing we can leverage is the pegged value of uh, the asset. So if you have two stable coins, USDC and USDT, they're both worth a dollar and they should be exchanged one to one, right? And we can leverage that knowledge as sort of an oracle and use that to inform our pricing and market making decisions. Um, some other examples are chain link oracles and uh, the pricing of other DEXs as well. So last thing before we get into the actual AMMs, um, I do want to concretely cover um, what, where, how I'm actually going to be showing these AMMs, right? I'm going to avoid the math. It's very interesting, but it's not, uh, it's not fit for a 25-minute talk on nine different uh, AMMs. So instead, I'm going to show this trading function, which is hopefully a bit more intuitive. And basically what this trading function shows is it shows uh, the space of possible trades that this uh, market maker will actually allow, right? So on the x-axis we have, um, on the x-axis we have the input amount and on the y-axis we have the um, output amount and this curve is the space of uh, trades that you can make, so this point for instance, is one trade you can make if you have 100 of the input asset, uh, this market maker will give you out 200 of uh, the output asset. And at any given point, the slope uh, sort of shows you the marginal price that you're getting if you keep on putting input into this market maker. So with all of that in mind, we can, we can now cover our very first AMM, and this one is the constant product market maker. Uh, so this one's huge, it's very important, it's been, uh, it's probably, well, it is the most popular one. Uh, it was introduced by Bancor originally, then Uniswap v1 and Uniswap v2, both uh, used it and popularized it a lot. Um, it's also important for the context of this talk because it essentially embodies uh, full-on price discovery, right? Uniswap v2 has no notion of uh, what a value, or what an asset should be valued at. It simply discovers that price. And how it does that is it sets the price as the ratio of how much of each asset it owns. And that allows um, the price to essentially respond to uh, demand. So you can see in the trading curve, as you uh, put more and more in, the slope of the curve continues to decrease. And that's showing the price responding to uh, the trading, so it's discovering the price. Now, on the other hand, as we said, if you can leverage an oracle, um, that can lead to much better pricing. And so a constant sum market maker is uh, sort of the full-on embodiment of this, right? So a constant sum market maker will provide a fixed rate of exchange at whatever the oracle is. So um, you can see on the trading function on the right, uh, there is now a completely constant slope, so a constant price, all the way up until the market maker runs out of assets, um, at which point uh, you can't trade anymore, right? Because uh, the market maker no longer owns any of this output asset. And this turns out to be a very precarious position for the market maker to be in. Um, for one, they're not earning revenue from trading anymore because they're illiquid. And for two, they now don't have a portfolio, right? They own all of one asset, and um, there's a lot higher risk of portfolio value change there, uh, which generally they want to avoid. Um, so there are some examples of this. Uh, technically, any wrapper contract is a constant sum market maker, like Aave. Um, maker has a peg stability module uh, that allows one-to-one -one exchange of uh, 
other stable coins for DAI, which sort of keeps the stability of that peg. And Synthetix has um, a fixed rate of exchange using uh, other external oracles for their synthetic assets, which is also quite powerful. Um, so those serve as uh, both models that are used in practice, but for the purposes of this talk, they sort of serve more as boundaries, right? They both have some big weaknesses. The constant sum is, um, if your oracle is even slightly off, you're gonna just lose all of one asset and you're not actually gonna be market making anymore, while the constant product, while extremely powerful, is not very efficient with its money uh, because it knows nothing about what the asset should be worth. And so uh, essentially what the rest of this talk is gonna cover is different types of mechanisms that can cover that middle ground. And these, are, these can be known as hybrid AMMs. Uh, the first of which will be stable swap. Uh, so stable swap was introduced by Curve. And essentially what stable swap is trying to do is it is moving from a constant sum a market maker, so from a really a fixed rate of exchange to a constant product as uh, the reserves get more and more out of balance. Because as the reserves get more and more out of balance, you can imagine that your price is probably a bit off, right? And so you want to start adjusting that price while still taking advantage of uh, that one-to-one -one exchange rate. And so this equation also has this amplification parameter. And that's what you're seeing in the uh, animation on the right. Uh, and you're seeing that as that amplification parameter increases, uh, the stable swap curve in purple moves from the constant product in blue to the constant sum, uh, very quickly closely approximating the constant sum because again, we wanna leverage this one-to-one -one exchange rate as much as possible. Um, so, other than uh, stable swap, there are some other stable solutions. Stable swaps generally the industry standard. Um, more recently though, there's been uh, solidly introduced an alternative equation for stable swap, uh, which is generally a bit more, uh, uh, slightly simpler, simpler to use as well because it doesn't have that amplification parameter. Um, for the purposes of this talk, we can compare it to stable swap and that's what you're seeing on the, uh, in the trading functions on the right. Uh, you're seeing uh, solidly stable in purple compared to stable swap with an amplification of two. And they're still different, but they're about the same at, at that parameterization. Um, now, an amplification of two is actually quite low. Typically, it's much higher than this. So solidly stable essentially represents a, uh, a low risk sort of stable swap that's still a big improvement over the constant product when there is that one-to-one -one exchange rate to leverage. Next up we have Dodo's proactive market maker. So um, Dodo has a mechanism, again, leveraging some external oracle. Uh, this can be chain link, this can be this one-to-one -one exchange rate. Um, and they introduce this parameter K that allows you to uh, continuously adjust from the constant sum to the constant product as K is increased. Um, and it does this in a bit of a smoother way than stable swap, with, which makes uh, more dynamic oracles possible to use. In general, uh, you can sort of think of K as representing your confidence in the oracle, right? So if you have, if you're extremely confident that the oracle is correct, you can set K to zero and you get a constant sum. You just get that fixed exchange rate, whereas uh, if your oracle is less reliable, uh, let's say it's a chain link oracle that can't update super often, you may set K somewhere in between these two and the curve will uh, leverage that oracle to inform its pricing, but it will also discover the price if that oracle turns out to be incorrect or there's large trade volume. Uh, Clipper is another one that actually has a K parameter that serves a very similar purpose. Um, the math behind it is, is very different uh, and very interesting, but um, the end result is again, you get this curve um, and this parameter K that allows you to adjust the curve between the constant sum and the constant product market maker. 
Um, now the interpretation of K as confidence in the oracle sort of has uh, some extra meaning here in that Clipper originally deployed their AMM fully on-chain, leveraging an on-chain Chainlink oracle. Um, now, as I mentioned, the limitation with a Chainlink oracle is that it can't possibly update faster than the block time. And so you can't have full confidence in the oracle uh, when its update time is limited. So more recently, what they've done is they've actually built a, another version that can leverage a fully off-chain oracle. And we're going to come back to how that's possible later in the talk. Um, but for now, the, the context of that is that uh, this allowed them to set K much lower. And so this is sort of a concrete example of K being uh, the confidence you have in this Oracle price. So last uh, hybrid AMM we're going to cover today is CryptoSwap. Um, we covered StableSwap as the first one. And StableSwap's fantastic for stable assets. Uh, Unfortunately, it's not very good for more volatile pegs um, because it so closely uh, matches that constant sum curve. So what Curve did is they took that stable swap curve and they essentially added another degree of freedom to it called the gamma parameter. And this parameter allows the curve to more quickly adjust from the constant sum to the constant product as uh, the reserves get more and more out of balance. And so on the right in the trading curves, what you're seeing is uh, the stable swap curve for reference in green uh, next to the crypto swap curve in purple. And you can see for very small inputs, the crypto swap curve is actually closer to the constant sum. Uh, whereas for very large inputs, it's much quicker to adjust away from the constant sum towards the constant product as it switches over to price discovery, right? So this allows it to uh, be used for uh, more volatile oracles, non one-to-one -one pegs, uh, which makes it um, very powerful and allows Curve to essentially expand to uh, other options. Now, there are quite a few other interesting things about CryptoSwap that sort of break the mold that we unfortunately don't have time to get into, so I encourage anyone who's interested to look more into that. Um, for now, we're going to move into another sort of type of AMM. Uh, these AMMs still live in between the constant sum and constant product, but uh, the thinking and concepts behind them are a bit different, and so I think it's worth approaching them from another direction. And that is through virtual reserves. So Kyber DMM is one example of uh, a mechanism that utilizes virtual reserves and what virtual reserves are, are essentially just pretending to have more of the assets than you actually have, right? So we're still using the constant product equation, but we are saying we have five times more of each asset uh, than we actually have. And so you plug these virtual reserves into the constant product equation, and you get what we see on the right, where uh, we have that constant product curve that moves closer and closer to the constant sum, as this amplification increases. Um, with the trade-off obviously being that you are introducing this zone of illiquidity because you don't actually have as much money as you're pretending to have. And so you have to be careful, of course, uh, how much and where you're concentrating this liquidity. And you really need to use uh, pairs of assets that are going to trade within some price range because once you exit this price range, uh, you become illiquid and you can no longer market ma make, which, as we discussed, is, is very bad. Um, so what we really need is to be able to leverage this powerful virtual reserve mechanism, but to also uh, have some freedom to move it around, right? And so that's exactly what Uniswap v3 provides. So Uniswap v3 utilizes these virtual reserves, but it basically says each individual liquidity provider can choose their own price range and implicitly amplification and concentration as well. Um, and so this is super interesting to me because it's essentially outsourcing this hard problem of deciding where to provide liquidity to the liquidity providers themselves. 
So the mechanism no longer has to solve this problem specifically, but uh, instead it's simply general enough to let liquidity providers decide what risk uh, and reward um, payoffs they want to take by deciding where to concentrate the liquidity. Um, now, the, there is not a trading function for this one, as you probably noticed. Uh, it's hard to appreciate the complexity that Uniswap v3 can provide with a trading function. Instead, what you're seeing is a liquidity graph. So um, on the x-axis is essentially the price, and on the y-axis is the liquidity at any given uh, point, which is essentially um, how flat the trading function is there. And you can see for reference, just for fun, we have Uniswap v2, which is just flat because it's uniform. Whereas Uniswap v3 has this very complex shape because this is sort of the combination of all these different ranges uh, that all these Uniswap v3 liquidity providers are providing liquidity in. And so, um, as everyone's probably aware, this has become extremely popular and uh, is responsible for a huge proportion of the DeFi trading volume. Um, because of how powerful this, this mechanism is. So that concludes all the uh, specific AMM types I'm going to cover today. Um, to close things out, I'd like to briefly cover how uh, we can build on top of these great on-chain mechanisms uh, and leverage off-chain computation as well to um, improve upon them even more. So. The first thing I want to cover are requests for quote systems. So I alluded to this earlier, and essentially what this is, um, is it allows the uh, market maker to do completely off-chain pricing, right? So uh, you can either leverage a real-time oracle, or you can leverage actual traditional professional market makers that are constantly manipulating the order book. Um, and you can then provide an API that anyone can hit, and they can get a quote and a signature with that quote. And you can then take that quote and signature on chain, um, and you can then execute it and compose it with all these other AMMs as well. Um, and so this becomes a powerful mechanism where we can leverage uh, this, these off-chain resources, which often allow for more efficient pricing, um, while still maintaining a lot of these on-chain benefits that we get from AMMs. Um, and so we have a few examples there. One is Clipper RFQ, which I mentioned, uh, which leverages that off-chain Oracle. Hashflow is another one that leverages these uh, traditional, essentially, market-making tactics and provides that as a uh, RFQ API that can then be leveraged on-chain. So with all of that in mind, uh, I'd like to close things out by asking the question now from the trader's point of view, um, how do we actually navigate this complex landscape and figure out where and how much to trade? Right? And just to summarize, um, what we've covered here are many different types of AMMs, which all have different purposes. Um, each type of AMM is actually implemented many, many times on chain, um, sometimes thousands of times in the case of Uniswap v2. So you have many choices there as well. Uh, it turns out since these trading functions are always adjusting their prices as you trade through them, uh, for any direct pair of assets, the best place to trade is actually usually a combination of different uh, liquidity pools instead of just picking one. So your problem is not just picking uh, one place, it's actually picking some arbitrary combination, right? And if all that wasn't enough, uh, the best trading price is often actually routing through other tokens as well. Um, and so the answer to all this, uh, as you may guess, is of course DEX aggregators, right? We have a very hard optimization problem and we can essentially uh, leverage off-chain computation um, to solve this problem and provide, again, uh, a transaction that still maintains a lot of the great qualities of on-chain um, AMMs by still allowing for atomic execution, self-custody, uh, still, you still have protection from slippage. Um, and so this is an incredibly powerful mechanism. Uh, and I have an example of uh, 
a particular trade you can execute with Odos specifically. Um, now with Odos, we visualize these uh, aggregation paths with what's called a Sankey diagram. And it's essentially showing the flow uh, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side through all these other assets and all these other DEXs. Uh, this one in particular actually has about 40 different swaps. So 40 different DEX um, interactions that you can execute all atomically. Um, this one is also showing multiple assets being traded at once. So this is another benefit that we can get from uh, sort of combining these AMMs, like building blocks, into a bigger transaction to execute a given trade. Um, and so, yeah, DEX aggregators, very powerful, and sort of an example, again, of leveraging uh, this off-chain execution um, for uh, even better experience over these amazing AMM mechanisms. And so that concludes things. Um, a few final notes. Uh, the parent company of Odos, Semiotic Labs, is actually giving a couple other talks today, so uh, I encourage you to check those out. They're related to artificial intelligence and cryptography work, uh, related to um, our work as core devs for the graph. Um, and we are also hiring, so you can feel free to reach out if any of that sounds interesting. Um, so yeah, that's time. <laughs>